Ricardo, mucha, muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much for, to, for giving us this opportunity. And I think it's a great opportunity because a lot of things are happening in Colombia. Uh, I know Ricardo and, and Miguel have a certain issues with Colombia and how the government is doing some things. And I respect that even though I'm part of the government. <laughs> uh, and I'm, that's why I'm here. I have no, no problem with, uh, with certain type of criticism when it's good criticism. I just want to highlight in, in, in the 15 minutes I have a combination of, of what we're doing at Bancoldix, which is a bank, state-owned bank, um, and the challenges that the country faces, and it has been facing in the past years, and still faces towards the future. And <clears throat> I came in in 2013 and tried to, to understand, I come from the private sector, no previous experience in the public sector. Uh, so I was like a, a, how do we call it, a bicho raro in the government, something different in the government, because no, no, no previous experience. So I found out that this bank, founded by President Santos when he was Minister of Commerce back in 1992 under, under President Gaviria's government. First mandate, traditional Exim Bank. In an economy where the exports in 1992, if in 2017 our export basket is still limited and not too sophisticated, you can imagine what an Exim Bank could do back in 1992. Uh, to foster exports out of a country with base its economy in natural resources. In 2004, the bank has its second mandate under President Uribe's mandate uh, government where they liquidated a financial institution because of political issues and Bancoldex assumed its assets and liabilities and started to focus also on domestic companies and also on investments in some certain companies through private equity. So when I came in in 2013, 2014, uh, we were trying to understand and under the challenges that Colombia has, and taking here some images from the international, the Atlas of Economic Complexity, uh, how the economy of Colombia, um, as you can see from 1962 to 2014, even though there's some type of diversification, we still depend plus or minus 70% of our exports are based on petroleum in 2014, coal, petroleum, oils refined, coffee, gold, and that's why our economy had, it took a, 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 a deep, a, 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 had a, a challenge recently due to the plunging of the exports because of 70% out of natural resources. Now, how do we juggle with a bank that had its own challenges in terms of being sustainable towards the future uh, and trying to generate impact, a second tier bank who tried to promote growth within companies through the commercial banking system of Colombia. Commercial banks are commercial banks. They're not development banks. Mr. Garcia knows that very well. And it was very difficult to generate impact and to help the economy grow through diversification. So, as you can see, this is another illustration of how Colombia's economy, if you look at the product space, has developed productive know-how, but in, the, in low complex products, and maybe some things are happening in certain parts of the regions of Colombia, uh, you start to see some things happening, some activities happening in more uh, sophisticated uh, production of goods. Now, when we started rethinking the bank, uh, we started challenging uh, certain paradigms and, and, and issues within the government. The government, first of all, thought that these this, this banks need to be a counter-cyclical bank. And I said, why? These banks need to be the catalyzers of growth on a permanent basis. And who should they support? They support, and we, we looked at data in Colombia, and we found out something very interesting, that in Colombia, 10 years of companies that grew at 21, almost 22%, at compounded annual growth rates. And this is all types of sectors of the economy, no specific sectors, because that's another thing that we did. We're not gonna focus in a specific industry. We're gonna be you know, uh, trying to stimulate growth wherever we can, and, and, and the economy will grow if you foster growth within the companies that have potential to grow or that are growing at double-digit rates. 
Now, then you have another group of companies who have been growing at single digit rates, which is, that's not growth. They've been declining in growth. Now, those guys need another type of intervention. So this, this is when we start, uh, and, and I, I took a chance to, to look at banks in Mexico. I saw Banco Mex, business model, nothing. I went to South Korea, Industrial Bank of Korea, the SBC, uh, the Korean Financial Corporation. I saw BNDES in Brazil. And uh, it, I was not looking for best practices. I just wanted to have some ideas and, and, and some insights that came out of, of, of that. Because Colombia has its own challenges. And I really don't care what they're doing in the rest of the world. You know, we need to understand what we need to do in Colombia. It's as simple as that. And the reality in terms of growth and in businesses is this. It's not what's happening in Brazil or in Mexico or anywhere else. So we took the, tried to understand what created growth within these guys of the 22%. And we found out something very interesting. Companies, for example, that inserted themselves in fertile ecosystems grew. Companies that opened their capital structures to smart capital, to equity from uh, new investors, when there was reconfiguration of companies, they grew. Companies that went abroad, and I, I, I had to report to a minister that Ricardo knows. Uh, she's a nice lady, very, but very tough, and she told me, why are we going to foster companies of Colombia to go abroad if we need to generate the jobs in Colombia? I said, it's good for Colombia to, if, they need, if, if we need a company of Colombia to transfer the talent to do something to imp implement their business model in Mexico or in Peru, and and they're still based in Colombia, but they buy an asset in Mexico, that's good for the country. They're going to go, if they're going to Mexico into the automobile industry, they're going to learn about the automobile industry in Mexico, and they're going to transfer that knowledge back into the, into the operations in Colombia. And they're going to tribute in Colombia, they're going to pay taxes in Colombia, they're going to bring divisas back, dollars to Colombia. So we understood that companies also that innovated in their business model, those were like the five levers of of growth within those double-digit rates companies. Now, the only best practice that we adopted, and I feel that it, it's worth adopting the best practices, and Ricardo knows why. Uh, we uh, received an asset and a liability of a bank that was liquidated because of political issues. The experiences in Latin America in public banks in direct lending was terrible in the decades of the 80s and the 90s. Mr. Garcia knows this very well. We went to the World Bank and to the ISC in Washington, and we asked them to help us to put in place the most sophisticated and strict governance in the bank. I had to tell the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Industry, eh, I'm sorry, but it's not me. The World Bank and the ISC recommends that you are not part of the board of directors. You need to leave. We need to give independence a collective skill sets. We need to have somebody who chairs the board with independence. Somebody who will interpret, in, interpret the mandate of the bank from the owners, which is the Minister of Commerce and the Ministry of Finance, and try to implement that within the government, within the uh, Colombian's challenges, but with total independence, segregations from executive uh, functions through board functions, two different things. I had to come out of several committees out of, the, out of the bank. So the only adaptation that we brought to our bank uh, is on governance. The most sophisticated governance based on the OECD guidelines. I know Ricardo and Miguel criticized a little bit about Colombia trying to adapt to the OECD. Uh, uh, yes, on this one. Bank Oldex said this. Because we feel that that's something that we do need to bring and put in practice. But not the strategy of the bank not the knowledge of our ecosystems in Colombia and our regional realities. Now, we configured the bank. We took it from, the big change was, from a channel-driven bank. We thought, or my predecessors thought, that the customer was the financial institutions that channeled our resources. And what we did is we configured the bank from the market based on the levers of growth of the economy in Colombia in the past decade. That's why now we're configured by growth platforms, and for example, we, have a, we treat different, the companies are, are only exposed to domestic growth. We are having different financial and non-financial services to companies that 
export from Colombia, or if we want to attract direct investments into Colombia through financing, uh, we understand the startup and scale-ups in a different way. We understand that the private equity and venture capital industry in Colombia is growing, and it's a way how to catalyze growth. So we invest in private equity and venture capital. And also, we're deliberately financing and co-investment to co-investments through financial through private equities and venture capital. Now, uh, uh, to to multi-Latin companies, Colombia has 80 plus companies in the world uh, 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 with positions, international positions, uh, which is something very interesting. They already account for three three percent of the the revenue or three percent of the GDP of Colombia. And finally, something we call dynamic ecosystems, which is the regions of the country. That's not the companies who we're focusing on, but on the regions. And I will explain that with the Atlas or what we did with this Atlas. And we also, the, one of the highlights of this transformation of the bank is that we have one vehicle for growth, corporate growth, and we're going direct lending now to them. We have another vehicle, which is a subsidiary company who will focus on access to SMEs, people who are in the, uh, those companies who do not grow, they have a different challenge to this. So in public policy, it's very different to service a sophisticated company to a company who is having trouble or people who are outside the banking system, which is about financial inclusion. In this, I just signed a mandate with the IDB in Paraguay two weeks ago, and the IDB is going to be part of the bank now. They're going to be our partners. And IFC is working with us right now to go into this financial vehicle. So we're going to have within an umbrella of the development bank three instruments for growth, corporate growth, access and inclusion. Three different worlds. I don't care what they do in Mexico. I don't care what they do in Brazil. If they have the infrastructure, rural things, we're having three types of instruments. Now, let me just highlight what the dynamic ecosystems, that this is where the Atlas comes in, and how um, when we try to structure projects, work with intelligence, valuable information that's provided by the Atlas in Colombia, and the consulting and guidance services. What we try to do is to try to identify through the Atlas, and I want to give an example of four examples, of how these potential, so potentially sophisticated firms, how we can serve them from the bank and the financial and non-financial services. So the Colombian Atlas of Economic Complexity, which is called Atlas Colombia, that which you can go in at bankgoldex.com, which with Ricardo and his team helped us, and we're going to the second version now of this with, with more data. We're trying to, to try to get a, an intelligent diversification strategy through regions of Colombia, not even the country, regions of Colombia, to try to conquer new markets, to take advantage of the national market, which is strong in Colombia, and to try to jump into higher complexity items. One example, I had a, the palm oil in Colombia is one of the high productive, I mean, it's, they, they produce high volume, they're not sophisticated. And this is an example, I had some people from the industry who represents them, come to my office, and I had to pull out on the third meeting that I have with them, I, since they were complaining permanently, I brought a box of Kleenex. You know Kleenex? To, you know, because they're always for crying and complaining. So I put a box of Kleenex, and the guy told me, what is that for? He said, no, this is for you to, I don't want you to keep crying. Let me help you with the Atlas and try to, I will help you to find, I will finance a new strategy for the industry, but let's give it a shot with the Atlas of Economic Complexity. So what did the Atlas tell us? Colombia, with data of 2014, we have 2015 coming out shortly, and 16 as well. If you see in terms of, of the complexity of the goods produced based on the industry of the palm oil, as you can see, you have negative complexity. And Colombia exports $269 million, and it grew from 2013 to 2014. But this is a commodity, low complex goods. Now, in that same industry, as you move down, a, to a higher complexity. This is like the food business that, that you can actually produce from capabilities out of the palm oil. And also here, when you start going into oleochemicals, uh, oleochemical, oleochemicals, uh, as you say, that where you have people who are doing interesting things, uh, uh, epoxides, uh, inks, uh, heterocyclic uh, compounds, uh, antifreezing, so vitamins. There's things being done in Colombia in different parts of the country. So now we worked with these guys to understand that if we have in the palm oil, we, we took the atlas actually, and, and, this, and they told us, look, 
a complexity, uh, this is an illustration of the complexity versus the distance. And the Columbia right now is here. Now, uh, the potential uses. Now, we, we work with the, with the industry to, in low, to, 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 the, you know, to the design a new strategy towards the future of like, and we call it what the low hanging fruits were and what the bets in the future were for this purpose. And now, what came out? It came out a, not a national strategy on palm oil, but it came out a regional strategy. And we designed for each region of Colombia where we had different facilities and plants uh, set up for in the palm oil business based on their capabilities and their know-how, what, uh, as you see in Bogota, in Medellin, in the north part of Colombia, in the west part of Colombia, in the uh, east side of Colombia, in the southwest, what type of products based on the industry uh, is, is done. So, and just to end up saying that if we put that in practice, we will be able to, uh, uh, you know, this is the, the commercial uh, uh, relationship of Colombia and, and the possibilities to, to transform that. In Colombia, as so you see, what's green is what exported. Uh, and what's red is what we import. If we manage to get these local capabilities to do things, we can actually do a lot of import and substitution of imports to produce based on the capabilities that we have in the country. And the same thing we did for a city in Colombia, and it'll be done in a minute. Uh, and the same thing in Colombia, in, in Cartagena and Barranquilla, and the governor who is in, uh, out of uh, the state of Atlantico, look what Barranquilla exports and look what Cartagena exports. We found out through the Atlas that if we put the, the know-how of Barranquilla with Cartagena together, we could actually produce transmission shafts. If we put that together within two cities which are 80 miles a, a, away from each other, and look what transmission shafts, the, this is from the, at the International Atlas, look the enormous amount of world trade in transmission shafts. Since like that, the cosmetic clusters in Bogota, for example, 1.6, 1.7, and look at Bogota's complexity index. Bogota is by far the most, di the most diverse city in Colombia where there's more know-how, and look what the cosmetics and uh, industry within the chemical and plastics, look at what's exported right now, the other day I was in a, in a forum in Colombia and I said that there was no flowers. They, they, they said, what, what, what do you mean by flowers? What does that mean? We're not going to export any more flowers. I said, no, you need to keep exporting flowers. What we need to do is see who's behind this industry. And we go down to the companies and we go down and drill down to the, uh, to the industrial classification of four digits. And we do that and, and see how in chemicals and plastics, in medicaments, in, in, in medicine, uh, in Bogota, we have companies who are very sophisticated, and we go to those companies and work with them, and we take this information to them and sit with the actual entrepreneur and tell them how, if they're aware of the situation. And look how Bogota can easily move into biotechnology. Nine companies in Bogota can move into biotechnology and have the capabilities. It's about connecting all the financial resources and support from the government and different institutions to do that. And finally, just the, the last, because this is a great example in Medellin. Medellin, there was one company, like Miguel mentioned, the, ex, the, the example in, in Chiapas. We found out in the product space in Medellin, one company who was in the electronic industry. That's that strange. So we looked who the company was. It was a, a subsidiary of a large corporation, which is called Grupo Corona. It's a huge corporation. And the company is called uh, Gamma, which is Electroporcelana Goma. And we found out that the, that the that Electroporcelana Gamma uh, Porcelain uh, can be regarded as a competitive and sophisticated company in Medellin. And look at how uh, the, uh, in the electronics, in the, the complexity index is 1.92, which is very high. And they have capabilities to produce electrical insulators in, in Medellin. And they're exporting to 12 markets. The thing is, they're not exporting to the most sophisticated markets in the world, even though that they have capabilities to do it right now. So those are the things that we're doing. We're connecting that. And what we're doing is we're trying to, for example, the bank, by law, can handle money from the royalties of petroleum and mining that the government gives to the different states. And what we're trying to do is we can structure projects based with this information. We go to the companies, identify the projects, and we try to connect the money from royalties to structure a project that will imply maybe the jumping of one industry to a more sophisticated from the bank as a structuring agent in the government. And then since, since as a development bank towards the future, 
we are able to be in the project from the day one the project is conceived to produce, for example, an electronic plant in Medellin, the bank can take a shot at financing it, at understanding that industry. Even my chief risk officer is using the Atlas now for risk assessment. Now they're looking, well, we're going to go direct lending. Let me see what's the complexity index on the, on the, from the Atlas. So uh, Robert was asking me a couple of minutes ago, hey, how are you actually uh, putting this into practice? I said, well, we're in the process. We just got this a year and a half ago, and we have been working now in different regions with industry, cities, and we're trying to make an effort of how can we make this a, a, a case to generate impact and make our economy on a regional basis and not on a national basis more sophisticated and try to you know, uh, take those challenges that we have ahead and put them in, uh, back in, in you know, and, and have our export basket to be much more sophisticated than it is right now. Thank you very much.